actually had a number of things for us to talk about today, and I need to apologize for how late I was. And I'm going to take that as a cue that I probably shouldn't talk about all the things that I had for us to talk about today. <laughs> but I did want to lift up momentarily the Lord's Prayer. And I don't think we understand what we are saying when we pray it. Our Father, that He's, he's all... He's, and here's, I need to take a step back from that. I need to take a step back from that. We have let bad theology into our church. It's true. False teachers and false prophets who might not realize that they are that because they believe those lies that they're spreading to other people. You see, there's this thing called universalism, which means that everything's okay. It's all okay. And it's all the same God and then every religion's fine, and we'll all just kind of get there in the sweet by and by. And I'm sorry, Jesus never says that anywhere. The Bible never says that anywhere. In fact, there are parts of the Bible that are very kind of what today would be called exclusional and conditional. They are. For example, what did Jesus say? I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's very exclusional, and that's very conditional, that he is the only way to heaven. And people don't like to hear that. They don't like to hear that there's one way. They don't like to hear that there's one truth. Well, no, 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 there are many ways, there are many truths. No. No. Jesus came, and when he stood before Pontius Pilate, he told us why. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to me. And so I, I, I just want to warn us. I'm going to take a step back before I start talking about the Our Father piece. God invites all of us. Okay, that part's not exclusional. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is invited. There is a seat at the table with your name on it, and he wants you there to be a part of his family. But that's a choice you have to make. Every road in the world doesn't lead to my house. There are only a couple roads that lead to my house. And in the same way, every road in the world doesn't lead to God. Jesus is the road that leads to God. And if we don't accept him, and if we don't take his payment for our sins, his death on the cross, his blood washing us clean, there is nothing, I'm looking at the camera for a second because there might be people to watch this online, there is nothing else that will save you. Nothing. None of us can be good enough. None of us can do the right thing. None of us can somehow earn our way into heaven. Please don't think that way. If that were true, why did Jesus come and die? If there were any other way, why did God become a man and die in our place? The truth is, we don't measure up. The truth is, on our own, we're not enough. But here's the thing. What does the scripture say? Right? With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Right? I can do all things, what, on my own? No. I can do all things through Christ, right? Through Jesus, who gives me strength. He's why I can do all things. He's my strength. He's our salvation. It's literally Him, His person. Not like a, a method or a way of thinking. It's Him and our relationship with Him. And that's what we need. And that's what the world needs. And that's not ever going to change. But that being said, it's God's heart that not one should perish the scriptures say. He doesn't want one person to die. 
He doesn't want one person to go to hell. Not one. That's a choice we make. And so Jesus deliberately says, our Father. Not just my Father, not your Father. Our Father. That not only changes our relationship with God, right? No longer this distant relationship, like you and the president. You probably don't, you know about the president. You probably don't have like an intimate friendship where you guys are like hanging out every day, right? And so the same way, God is king, but when we call him king, that's a very distant relationship. Yeah, God's king somewhere, you know. But when God's your father, and I have to apologize for those who have not had good situations with their dad, that's a struggle. But God wants to be your good father, right? That means he's in it. He's in your life. He's looking out for you. He's together with you. You're living together day in and day out. Blood, family. Our Father. Right? And that even changes our relationship with each other. Right? If God's your Father and He's my Father, what does that make us? Brothers and sisters. That's right. You treat your brothers and sisters different than you just treat everyone else in the world, don't you? But if God is our collective Father, then can we just treat everyone else in the world like everyone else in the world? No. You are my brother or my sister. And that's just the first two words of the prayer, (laughs) y'all. But I'm not... As, as much as I want to, we might talk about that next Sunday. I'm going to dive into Matthew 25 for us today. And I want to invite you into some questions. And the questions are, who are we? As people and as a church, who are we? And how did we get here? And who have we been? And in regards to who we are and how we got here and who we've been, who are we becoming? Where are we going? What's the course? What's the, what's the plan? What's the destination? What journey are we on? You know, in this passage where Jesus talks about heaven and hell and he talks about the sheep and the goats, what was the difference? that stand out to anybody? What was the difference between the ones that went to heaven and the ones that went to hell? What was the difference between the one he called sheep and the one he called goats? Yes. That's right. And the goats didn't. When I was hungry, he fed me. When I was thirsty, he gave me something to drink. When I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I needed clothes, you gave me clothes. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. Are we doing that? Because that same definition about what makes you a sheep or a goat applies to us too. Are we doing that? In some ways... I'm proud to say, at least in trying to feed the hungry, we are. We've got the food pantry. And I'm proud of us for doing that. We're going to give some money to support that today. We're answering one of those things God asked us to do, feed the hungry. Good. What about clothing the naked? What about caring for the sick? visiting those in prison. I went to the nursing home a couple times this last year. That was a step in that direction, maybe, depending on who you talk to. Some might say that's the sick. Some might say that's the imprisoned. But we've got a correctional facility right over in Hooker. We could go visit them. We've got hospitals and nursing homes all around us of people who would actually love to have you there. It might make all the difference in the world. 
And Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Now, why did he pick sheep and goats? Sheep, by and large, aren't the brightest animals in the world. But you know what they do pretty well? They follow. They follow. Goats might be a little smarter, but you know what they're known for? Being stubborn. They won't follow. They want to do things their way. They're ready to butt heads with you. That wasn't an accident that Jesus picked those two animals. Do we want to follow Jesus? Because following Jesus means we need to do the things he does, right? Believe the things he believes. Say the things he says. Actually, most of the things that Jesus said, he was actually quoting scripture. A lot of us, we shy away from the Old Testament, but if we loved it a little more, we would realize Jesus was quoting scripture all the time. The two things he quoted the most were the Psalms and Isaiah, but there were several other passages that he quoted, even when he was on the cross. Those were scripture quotes. Do we live in him that way? John said, the word of God made flesh, right? Living embodiment of God's word. God wants to live in us like that. That our words would be his words. That our love would be his love. That our actions would be his hands and feet in the world. You can be that. I can be that. As a church, can you imagine if we got together and we said, okay, how do we be like Jesus? And let's do that. Does the world need more Jesus? What do you think? I think so. Do you need more Jesus? Do I need more Jesus? I think so. I don't think I can get enough. In fact, even as a pastor, I think I make far too little time for him. How are we spending our time? Are we loving him? Are we doing the things he commanded us to do? I want to remind you quickly of those verses, John chapter 14, 15, 16. How did Jesus define love? If you love me, You will obey my commands, just as I love my Father and obey his commands. So if we're not doing the things that Jesus asks us to do, then the truth is, we don't love him. And those words were coming straight from his mouth. So let's love him. Let's change that. Let's do the things he's asked us to do. And I praise the things that we have done, not just the food pantry. There are many ways that we have loved and given to children, to families, all throughout the years. And I celebrate that, and I don't make light of that. But there is a now. There is a today, right? And God willing, there's a tomorrow. And what are we doing now? And who are we going to be tomorrow? I believe in you. I have faith in the potential of this church. I think we are ready to take that next step. To grow deeper with God. To grow deeper in reaching out and loving others. And if we would do that, the things that that we talk about, that we think about, I heard several people say at Carrie's funeral, wouldn't it be great if the church was this full all the time? If each of you brought one person or two people, it would be. Think about that. If I brought two people and you brought two people and each of us brought two people, the church would be three times as big as it is right now. But that's what it takes. It takes reaching out to others. 
It takes pouring into their lives. It takes going and inviting them, maybe even picking them up physically and bringing them with you. And here's the thing. That's how we got here. I don't know if you remember, but there was someone in your life that either brought you to church or that poured themselves into you trying to urge you to go to church. I don't know of many people that just wake up and like, I'm, I'm going to go to church today. You know, that's just, that's not how it happens usually. And so if we will continue to be those people, not only that we are disciples ourselves, but that we will make disciples, not only that we receive love, but that we will give love and pour that into people's lives and do for them what others before have done for us, maybe the church will be in a very different place. Does that make sense? But if we don't do that, I promise, if we don't do that, what we're going to do is continue to see people age. What we're going to do is continue to see our, our brothers and sisters graduate to go to God's kingdom. And it's going to just start looking a lot into day after day. I know you don't want that. And I know that I don't want that either. And so the way that that changes is I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to be a little brave. And I'm going to have to ask you to show a little bit of your love for God by going to someone else with that love. By going to someone else with that bravery. And if you say, well, you know, my friends, my family, the folks around me, like they're ready to go to church. Well, there are a lot of people around you that aren't your friends and they aren't your family and they don't go to church. In fact, the demographics that I've seen show that over half this area is unchurched. whether that's going and visiting the correctional facility in Hooker, whether that's going out to the state line and visiting a couple of the folks around there, whether that's going into Liberal. I mean, most of us, we spend a lot of time in Liberal. And maybe it's stopping by, talking to someone at the store, in the parking lot, wherever it is, saying, hey, how are you doing? How's life going for you? Tell me a little bit about your, your faith. I go to the Methodist church over in Pilgrim. You know, most people are actually pretty open to talk about that. But it's funny that so many of us, we don't ask. And I want to remind you of this one scripture. How can people know God, know the gospel, unless someone goes and shares it with them? You can be that someone. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary or someone like that to make an impact for God's kingdom. A lot of the people that made the most impact for God's kingdom, they weren't full-time pastors or missionaries. They were ordinary folks working their jobs, living with their family, but passionate for Jesus and passionate to reach other people and let them know and love the same Jesus that they know. And I'm asking you, will you be like that? Will you be one of those people? Will you make an eternal difference in someone's life? We have to put aside our fear. We have to put, put aside our feeling of being inadequate. And we just need to share Jesus, who he's been in our lives, and what he means to us with other people. I've got one that's ready to do that. <laughs> so, let's pray together this morning. <laughs> Lord Jesus, Help us to love you openly, 
unashamed, unafraid. Help us to share you with other people, not not the folks that are on street corners yelling out of a megaphone, but people that listen, people that pray, people that care, people that live by the scriptures and say, hey, like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread, let me show you where I found my hope. Let me show you where I found my strength. Let me show you where I found something that money can't buy. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be your witnesses right here in this part of the earth and to the ends of the earth. We love you, Lord, and help us, please, love you more and love you better. Feel and know your love. <laughs> Live and move and have our being in you. We always need you. And I pray, Lord, that when you have need of us, use of us, that we would be it in service. It's in your precious and holy and powerful name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.